Hey guys, Mike, your host of Crushing Your Fear. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm sure you had some fears going on today. We all we all do. I do every day. It doesn't matter. I talk about it. I'm the host, whatever, Crushing Your Fear. I still have fears. And there's a lot of stuff that I think about, you know, and I, I try to preach this other stuff. And then I, I start to fall into this fear pattern. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> You know, I had a guest on and maybe they said something and I'm like, why don't, you know what, I'm, I'm having these guests on, I'm, I'm preaching this stuff. I got to, I got to do it, right? But yeah. So I'm like, uh, I'm like, okay, I'm okay now. No, it's not, we can handle the fear. Uh, but we have Chris uh, Arsberger. He's uh, in Arte with me. We're going to the summit uh, after this is, well, it has, it has happened after this is published, but in St. Louis with Andy Frisilla and Ed Milet. Uh, they are running an RT, which is an entrepreneurial group, just pouring a lot of great stuff into us. And there's just fantastic people in this group. And and, and Chris was telling me his story, and I said, look, you got to come on the uh, Crushing Your Fear podcast and, and tell people what you're doing and how you overcome fear. So we had a, a great conversation. So uh, here we go. Okay, we have Chris Arsberger. Uh, he is a, an, an Arte brother. We're both going to the Arte Summit in St. Louis. It's crazy. I can't believe it, <laughs> but I'm going. Uh, Arte is uh, Andy Frisilla and Ed Milet. They're going to be we're going to Andy's house. It's like crazy. But anyway, uh, you are the owner of IB Logistics. Um, you're also a life coach at Inertia Medical, and you're also doing some great things with um, you know with low income families and helping uh, children out as well. And and. You know, I, I said, uh, maybe you should come on the podcast, you know, and talk about it. So, Chris, thanks for coming on today. Oh, Mike, I really appreciate I'm humbled that you give me this opportunity. You know, when we first talked a couple of weeks ago, it was great getting to know you. And just really humbled that you invite me on here. And I'm hoping to add some value. No, I think you're doing some great things, you know. And um, so what I like to do is just throw it back to the guest and, and say, hey, you know, what kind of major fear has gone through your life and, and how you've overcome it. That helps our listeners. Um, so I'm just going to send it back to you. All right, cool. Sounds good. The first major fear that I recollect is growing up, just not being enough, not good enough. Um, my father raised me in a very performance-based family. And there was a lot, a lot of pressure to perform. And a lot of times I did just not feel like I was good enough, did not fit in. Hmm. But in reality, the only model I had to overcome that was to just try to work harder. At this time, I really wasn't, I was going to church. I mean, I, I, I was going to church, but I really did not know God the way I know God now and the way I know Jesus now. So I really didn't right. have faith at that time. I only had my mom and dad to set the example, and they were both uh, very good role models as far as work ethic and, and and just making sure that you continuously, consistently do the right actions and that success comes. But my dad put so much pressure on me that I had, you know, if my grades were down, I was going to get in trouble. You know, at one point, my dad even told me that if I did not get a scholarship, to college, I was not going to college. Wow. So I had lots and lots of pressure that formed what, what I had to do. That's, and that was just work, work my butt off. That's heavy duty. I mean, and I wrote a book last year. It's not out yet, but one of the chapters was about um, parents and their kids and putting so much pressure on their kids to do the best that they can possibly. I mean, you want them to do the best that they can possibly do, but then they set these, these bar, you know, these, these, uh, high standards and then when the kids don't meet that like they, they if they get all straight a's right for one semester fine the next day they get straight a's and then they get a b and then they're, they're crushed and and then like my god what's mom gonna think and oh my god and now you know about the scholarship as well i mean that's a, did you play any sports in school as well or yes i did i played football i focused on football and i was able to start for the number one large school in new york we're number one in the state I was outside linebacker and I was able to play football for there. Um, I did end up getting a scholarship from the Air Force. The Air Force came down and they recruited me due to my grades and my extracurricular activities. And I ended up getting a, going to RPI, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, and uh, getting an engineering degree there. But that whole child life formed me to just be not a relationship type person at that time. It really focused on 
the goals, the end results versus the process. And that really hurt me in the rest of my life. Hmm. So how did it hurt? How, how do you feel it hurt, hurt you? Because I feared relationships. Mm. I would not, my, my, my um, mom and dad did not have the best of marriage. They're still married today, but they did not have the, they did not model a really good relationship. It was all performance based so much so that, you know, my dad hardly ever came to my football games. You know, he was busy working. Wow. And so my relationship suffered from that. And that is one of the main reasons, you know, I did end up getting a divorce, um, a couple of years ago after 24 years of marriage, but I just did not have a lot of grounding in my relationship. So I'm putting a lot of work into that side of me for the last probably eight, eight to 10 years, really trying to, to, to figure that out. Yeah. Did he have his own business, your father? Or? Yes, he did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my dad had his own business too. And, and, you know, he, I mean, he, I guess he tried the best he could have, but his, his father passed away when he was young, like 12 years old. So he never, never really had a, kind of a father figure and he, he really he tried to be the best father figure I guess that he thought that he could be but still he wasn't home uh, but I mean you know like what's the balance right you got to take care of your business but you also got to take care of your kids as well you know and, and make sure that you neglect family and I've been divorced twice too so I kind of feel where where you're at and you know I mean the yeah <laughs> I've talked to my dad about it. I forgive him. I don't hold any grudges because he yeah. did provide. But I do talk to him about, you know, really being so performance-based and not showing up to my games and all those things. And, and even to this day, he has a hard time telling me that I, I do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, I've had, a, actually was in the Million Dollars Mastermind and Steve Weatherford was there. Uh, he was speaking on stage and he had the same issue with his dad, like the, his whole life. Like he couldn't, he just couldn't impress him to say good job. He even won the Super Bowl and he gave him the trophy. And he said, you know what my dad said? That's nice. And he gave it back to him like the Super Bowl. Like, you know, it's a, you know, what parents do to their kids. I mean, maybe they don't realize it, but like one sentence or one gesture could, could just scar a kid for the rest of his life, you know? And, you know, to this day, even when I do good things, my dad says, oh, you're very lucky. Yeah. You're very lucky. Because how can you do that? You have the smarts for that? I didn't know you could be that smart. Wow. I mean, did, what was his, maybe his dad was like, I guess yeah, that did. that's he, probably he, a pass down, you know? And this is thing, yeah. it's called covert depression too, that pe- get passed down. Because I was diagnosed with that stuff too. Because it's, you know. Mike, you're right. He, he had a bad. He was raised poorly by his dad. A lot of abuse. So, you know, I understand. You know. Yeah. So, but I mean, you've done a lot of great things. I mean, I've seen and I've talked to you, and you've done like super things. You know, and now you're you're helping, um, you know, others as well. Um, and I guess you got through the airport. You had the, the you had the marriage. You have kids too, right? Or yes, I do. I have two kids: a 21 year old and a 16 year old. But I'm going to talk about the next fear that I had is, you know, I went in the Air Force, and that's when I really found my faith. I accepted Jesus Christ as a freshman in college. And then when it, four years later, I went in the Air Force. I was in that first Gulf War in 1990-91 time frame. And I had to come to grips with, the, with my fear of dying because I was going into a war zone, and I was going to probably face live combat. So I called up my mom and dad and I said, mom, dad, I'm going someplace. I can't tell you where, but I am prepared to die. Wow. And I had, and I had to come to that conclusion because I would not be able to perform my job if I did not come to that conclusion, if I was all right with that. But one of the main reasons why I was all right with that, because I had my faith established at that time. And I had four years of walking in my faith. Wow. So I believe God set me up. I believe God said, okay, I'm going to train you to be able to do this wartime environment, you know, because your faith is grounded in me now and you have the peace that if you do die, you're going to heaven. Wow. And how, how did it feel? I mean, the whole environment and, and going and that so must have very, been something else. So 
So I was there for eight months. Uh, you basically did not know when you were working. You just, I slept on a cot with a couple other people that worked for me. And, and um, we just, you just get your, you know, just woke up and say, Hey, it's time to go work and, and stuff like that. And then, you know, of the eight months, we had five days of combat where bullets were, uh, were hitting cement cinder blocks behind my head. And the, the, the cement was hitting me on the cheek. Jesus. And that's, and that's when I knew that God was protecting me because literally a couple inches over and now probably dead. But because the cement was hitting me, you know, I was like, oh, you know, now Holy obviously cow. after that happened, I move. I thought I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to try to go someplace else. I tell my men, uh, we're working with me. Let's go someplace else and seek some better cover. Wow. That's something else, so, man. Yeah, there, there is definitely fear and you, you know, you, you wonder about your life, whether you're going to make it. But for me, it was my faith in Jesus that, that, that allowed me to do a good job and not be crippled by that fear. And you had a mission to do. So when you have a mission to do, you're also focused on that because you've had all this training. And the Air Force provided me a lot of training to do that job. And, you know, I mean, your faith in, um, you know, and we, we talk about God and I talk about God as too. And, you know, there, uh, people talk about a universe, whatever it is, there's got to be some type of higher power. I always say yes. And people don't believe it. And I just, I, I don't know. I mean, you see things the way they like trees grow in a certain way. Birds fly. We as humans can think of stuff and create things like that stuff just doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> Yeah. It just doesn't like, okay, it happened one day. It it's there's something that infused this into us. This is God and uh you know, there is a lot of energy around us and, and whatever we think about we attract. You know, I'm reading the the laws of attraction and you know, whatever we want to become, we will and, and I keep saying the quote from Henry Ford, uh, if if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Right. So it just depends on where your level is, where you want to be. I think we're both in our and we want to elevate ourselves to that next level. We're going to that summit where we're going to be around some superstars. And, uh, you know, I've heard about uh, other things, other summits they've done in the past and people have been blown away. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that was now how long were you in combat for? So we were in combat for five days. We were in Iraq for eight months. So, but we only had five days. We were fighting the Republican Guard. If you remember, they had, had this elite Republican Guard. And we had taken over an airport in northern Iraq, about 60 kilom 100 kilometers from the Turkey border in. And then we were flying missions out of his airport. We'd taken it over. And we had Apache helicopters. We had A-10s. We were fighting. We were re re reacting out of that area whenever we heard of insurgencies or battles. We would re react. But they actually attacked our camp. Wow. So they were, they, they, they actually, you know, were attacking every, you know, not just the war fighters, not the people that had the guns and stuff. We all had guns, but we, that's, I'm a logistics officer. That's not my primary job, you know? Jeez. But you were in the Air Force, right? Correct. Yes. Yep. Now that was Air everybody Force. there, like the, the SEALs and everybody, all the, yep, all the yep. units? We had, we had, we had, we had Marine, we had um, French, Italians, British, we had Marines, we had everybody. We had a whole coalition Jeez. of forces, you know? My God, that's a situation to be in. And and the, the the at nighttime, you would not even see the helicopters because they would be in blackout condition. All you would see is the tracer rounds and the explosions and the missiles going off, like right by our camp. What are we right on top of us? You know, because the rounds of the enemy were hitting our camp, like hitting my hitting the, the center blocks right behind my head. So this was close combat. My God, you know, like who could think about that stuff? And you know what? People, you know, disrespect this country and disrespect the flag. And you guys are like over there trying to protect stuff, right? right. That's disgusting. I think it's disgusting yeah, what yep. people are doing, right. you know? And, and, and this is the stuff that you hear. And this is life. And, and people don't like this country and they, they talk against the U.S. Put them in battle like that, right? <laughs> Shape right. them up. Shape them right up, right? I mean, I've never yeah. been, I haven't been in the forces, but I, I, I respect you guys. And, you know, thank you for your service. And it's fantastic, I think, what you guys have done, you know, protecting your, your country and dying for your country. I mean, it's unbelievable. Have you, uh, what kind of, do you have any casualties when you were there? Or? 
there were casualties, like four or five guys got killed. Wow. Um, I remember when I came back, I didn't think I was that affected, but at that time, I eventually got married, and my wife at that time said that I would scream and yell during the night, uh, you know, for for a long period of time. And then eventually went away. I never did get treated or anything like that because it never manifested anything worse. But she says I, she definitely heard me at night talking about the war, talking about things and screaming out and things like that. So it did affect me more than I ever thought it did. God. No. Wow. But I realized, though, that all those situations happen for us, you know, not to us. And that right. allows me to do that, the, the coaching that I do now with the low income and the poverty people because they face so much fear, you know, fear of acceptance, financial fears, fear of, of, of whether they can even do the job, you know. So I can re- relate to them. And a lot of those, some of those people have been divorced. Some of those people have had death in their families. You know, their kids have been gunned down. So I can sort of sometimes relate a little bit about that. So I know that God's put me in the right spot to, uh, to, to relay that information, to relate to people, to, to form those relationships that I never had earlier in my life that I knew now I have amazingly abundant relationships. It's amazing now how it's all turned around. Yeah, that's fantastic. You, you, you mentioned that, uh, bef- you know, when we were talked originally about, um, the, the the low income families that you're helping and people because they come from the homes that are not solid. It's unfortunate, you know. There's, maybe there's a, a broken home or maybe the a, you know a mother uh, with, with no father around, and you know that's where you kind of step in and fill in the void and kind of work with them, which is very noble. Um, how'd you get involved with that? That is an um, an outreach through the church I go to. I um. Heard a little spiel about it. Someone stood up about it. Say, hey, we have this organization called Thrive Together. And that's being in the Air Force. I always like to mentor people. You know, I had like 50 people working for me in the Air Force. So I always love that mentorship. I love that. And even in the Bible, the Bible says you should always be a mentor and a mentee. You should have people you're mentoring and you should be a mentee to, 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 to people um, from someone, you know? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to adopt that model. So when they called, they said, he said, hey, we have this organization called Thrive Together. We work with low-income people. We try to give them a hand up versus a hand out. We coach these people. We give them skills. So I said, all right, I'll try. I'll, I'll go in there. And sure enough, over the two and a half years, they've made me a coach. I teach classes there. I'm, I'm in charge of all the external partners as far as the food banks, the churches, some automotive stores uh, give us uh, um, discounts. So I try to make sure we have a really good relationship with all those partners that support us. We do handwritten notes. The people in poverty write handwritten notes to them and we give them notes to say how they, how the food impacts us, how the good deals at the automat uh, at the mechanic helps us, you know, so really cool. Um, and, and what's really great is that the whole, the whole lessons that we've learned over the last years in Arte have been, I've been able to apply them directly to this organization. Well, that's great. You know, that's, so that's fantastic. Awesome. I love that. You know, with core values and, yeah. um, you know, just training them and, and just uh, telling them that, that life is not, uh, life is very positive. You have to think, uh, you know, there is abundance around, like you said before. And it's just tapping into that and then becoming, uh, you know, the best that you can be. That's so true. Just la- last night we had our, we have a Tuesday night meeting every Tuesday. And, you know, this one woman who I'm coaching, she was in poverty. She now has her bachelor's degree. She has her own house now. And now she wants to open up her own business. Wow. So I told her I would help her. I would help coach her. Well, last I said, hey, tell me some status. And she goes, Chris, I'm very fearful. And I started talking about identity. I said, make sure your identity is big enough so that you don't get fearful when success starts hitting you. Because success could start hitting you and you want to take the foot off the gas. Because you don't think you deserve it. So your identity needs to be big enough to go after that success. Today she texts me. She goes, wow, I am on fire today because of what you told me last night. Wow. You see so that? I was just like, wow. You know? See that one Arte, conversation? Right she's like, boom. Arte. <laughs> you know? 
But it is, and I've heard it. I've heard it. The fear of failure is there, but also the fear of success. You know, and yeah. and Ed talks yeah. about it too with the thermostat. You know, keeping your yeah. thermostat at uh, a higher level and getting around people. That's what we're doing. You and I are, are traveling to St. Louis yeah. to get around these people that are just like my mind's going to melt right when I talk to these people. <laughs> Even in Apex, I talk to people. I'm in the Apex executives and. You know, he's like, yeah, we had a okay month. Like we made 900 last month. I'm like, 900 what? Like 900,000? He's like, yeah. I'm like, what? Last month. He's like, oh, yeah, we had a bad month beforehand. It was only 600. I'm like, what? Like that kind of talk and that kind of stuff. But you got to be around these people. And they're great people, you know. It's just they, they've they had something and, and they figured it out and then they scaled it. Boom, you know. And, yeah. and, and I guess that's the formula, you know. But – to pass that g- great advice that you gave to this lady, I mean, imagine you, you've changed her life. She, if she has kids, she's, you're going to change their lives, right? She'll pass that on to the kids. And um, that's, that's just a great thing. It's very, very, you know, when I went there, I thought I was going to mentor people, but really they blessed me. They blessed me by working with them. They wow. really bless me. I get so fired up by just hanging out with them because they struggle. You know, when I think my life's bad, their lives are way worse than oh, my yeah. life. You know? I mean, I mean, they're facing all sorts of stuff, drugs and, and, and men who beat them and abuse them and all oh, this God. stuff. We deal with all these issues, Mike. And, and I'm just like, they're very inspiring because they don't give up. You know, they have fear, they have doubt, but if you can come alongside them and coach them, they are they people. They want to improve. They don't want to be in poverty. They don't want to live no. in a low income housing. They don't want to do that. They want to better their lives. They want to change their family generationally. Change their family tree. Yes, they do, Mike. But they don't, don't know how to do it because no one's believed in them. Right. Everybody talks bad and doubts them. So this organization has been a wonderful blessing to be a part of. And we just had this past year an organization in Tennessee has come up and they got themselves immersed in us and they've opened up a branch down in Tennessee doing the same thing we're doing here. God. So God's working in amazing ways. Wow. I like to talk to you about that too, because I'm part of the, the Milliard group. That's Ed's uh, new, um, you know, brokerage. He's the broker, right. Ed Milet, yeah. and uh, I'm helping families, but you don't need to have really a background to jump into it, but all you need is like an insurance license and you just need determination and drive and you could change. And, and people have changed their family trees. There's been single mothers, right? People coming from that, uh, you know, a bad environment and just jumping in and just exploding and doing crazy great things. And then you're helping right. families in the process too. There's a lot of right. families out there that don't have, you know, they talk about insurance. Oh my God, he's talking about insurance. But what if the, one of the parents passes away and dies? I had a call. We had a call from a lady in New Hampshire. Uh, we knew them, family. They had two kids, eight and ten. She said, "Yeah, my they just found my husband on the side of the road, forty years old. He had a heart, a massive heart attack. Found him on the side of the road. He had no insurance. They took the house away. The kids don't have a, a freaking, you know, college education. People don't think about that stuff. Yeah, I have an." They don't really plan, and they don't plan for the worst. God forbid something happens, but if you're going to have a family, you're going to have assets. You got to protect them, you know. And this is a great way for if you know anybody in your group that wants to plug in, I'd love to plug them in. I mean, those are the kind of people I want, you know, to have fire. <laughs> I got to talk to you after this call. We have to figure it out. But that's the kind of people because a lot of people in the U.S. take a lot of stuff for granted. You know, I talked about before putting people in battle, right, and then understanding what what's going on. They don't respect the country. They don't they don't appreciate what they have: food, running water. I got one guy on my team. He was from Nigeria. He's like, you know how I got water? I went down to the river with a bucket and I brought it back to the house, and that was our water. I'm like, holy cow, right? right. <laughs> and now he went. Actually, he was in the armed forces too. He was in the, in in the army in the U.S. But he's a really fantastic guy. But he had a lot of drive, you know. Uh, but that's Anybody can do it. We we all have that within us. We cannot resign to say, yeah, we can't do it. That's BS. That's a cop out. That's the, the Ryan calls it. Ryan Stuman calls it the force of average, bringing you back down. You got a lot. God put you on. He put you in this earth, in His likeness, and He wants you to do the best that you can and help as many people as you can. That's what it Amen. is. Amen. Right. 
And you're doing it. And hopefully I'm doing it through this podcast and I have you on and we kind of preach to people. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not a a preacher, but you know, I'm trying to say what's on my mind and a lot of people resonate with it. So it's a good thing. And I got a lot more in me to do and and I'm just kind of trying to figure that out. But anyway, but that's, that's kind of what we're here for, you know? Yes, I agree a hundred percent. I think like you said earlier, people need to have a faith in something, you know, whether it be a faith in the God or faith in the universe, whatever, because that faith is the opposite of fear. If you are fear based, faith wipes out fear. So that's why I love the shirt faith over fear, because my faith, although I have some fear, that fear happens in such a small little bit of time before my faith wipes it out. It says, all right, done with that. No need to, to, to think about that anymore. You know that you have a God that loves you and a God that's working things out for you. And everything that happens to me is happening for me, not to me. It's for a lesson. Like I said, these people I'm coaching my whole life. I've been able to relate to these people better than I would if I didn't go through those circumstances. Yeah. You know, you think about it, right? Like you went through it and you understand and now you can help them. But that's the reason why you went through it. So things do happen for you rather than to you. This is a perfect example. But now you're giving back and you're helping them and you don't want the same thing. How are your relationship with your kids? I mean. So my one son. I'm getting deep, but. (laughs) No, it's all right. Um, We have no relationship at all. Nothing. Him and I. Oh, really? Okay. Sorry. I don't want any relationship with you. Um, I text him every single day. I've been texting him for about probably two years every day. And I write him a handwritten letter once a month. I haven't gotten any feedback on him. All right. Now, sometimes I do see him. If he, if we, if he happens to go to the gym, I might bump into him and I will talk to him and he will talk to me. I also see him sometimes if he goes to my daughter's horse shows, my daughter does sh- uh, shows for horses, shows horses around. And he sometimes go to those and he always talks to me in person cordial but not nothing great you know so mm. um, I know once again I'm, I have my faith that I know that someday I'm very hopeful that me and my son will have a relationship and I know that God is working on me so that I can be ready for that time so I'm not the same dad that he saw before yeah yeah I don't want to get too much into that but that's uh, uh, it's right. unfortunate I, but I, I, I think Open book, Mike. Open book, guys. <laughs> Open book. Ask away. <laughs> but what do you think? It's because maybe the divorce or something. What do you yeah. think? It's divorce. divorce. Yeah, and he doesn't. Yeah. He can't yeah. accept it. But I think he's going to turn. Right. Around. He's going to come back around. You know, he's yeah. his I dad. Agree. I agree. I agree. I mean, I did I, the I, same. I I don't know how families can do this. Like they shun kids, and you know, they, right. that's yeah, crazy know. stuff. You know, like I I don't know. I'm very opinionated, but I I don't. It just doesn't sound right to me. But I think he's just getting over he has to go through that process but i think you know if you you keep loving him and and texting him and yep. writing stuff he's gonna be like gee what am i doing you know and i think well a great around. thing happened in this past christmas is that my ex-wife actually talked to me and said i you know i'm at the point now that i've healed a lot and i can actually talk to you and i feel i, I think good things of you now so with her mindset changing about me i know that that will filter down to my son and then it'll be only a matter of time. So me and her are going to start going out to lunch or dinner every now and then to, to afford your a, a friendship, you know? I think you have to do that. I mean, I have my ex wife well, I have two ex-wives, right? But I had the, the second one was with kids. And I think you got to have that kind of relationship for the kids and just show that, all right, we're two people. We cannot live together. The marriage, we right. did it, but it's just, it's not working anymore. But we're still, you know... We're still, yeah, yeah uh, you know, connected and, and just, it's okay. And then if the kids see that, then they'll be, you know, much better. I mean, I have young kids. I have like, like 15, 12 and eight, right? right. So they're very impressionable. And I, I, I try to make an effort to, you know, I mean, I don't like what happened and, but I'm over that. And uh, I think it was for me rather than to me. Like if that didn't happen. I wouldn't be on my air mattress in my strip mall and lost the house and lost the family. And I wouldn't have started this podcast and I don't know who I'm going to help with this podcast, but you know what? I'm going to bring people on. I'm going to keep doing them. If I can help one person, like you're helping people. Yep. That's exactly it. Mike. And we're connecting one and point. I want to get your people into my team because I think they're on fire <laughs> and that's going to benefit everybody. So I think it's fantastic. We're going to benefit so many families that way, you know? So, 
so that's awesome. Yeah. So, all right. Um, to, to wind down, um, I appreciate you coming on and, and you've been through a lot. I look forward to meeting you, man, in a couple of days. We're going to see each other in a couple yeah. of, you're, you're organizing yeah. that dinner. We're going to have some dinner yeah, and dinner. Night. it's going to be awesome. That's going to be Great. freaking crazy. Yeah. So, um, Good what do you, um, uh, what can you uh, send out there to everybody as final thoughts uh, in terms of fear and, you know, facing your fears and overcoming them? Uh, and then give us some background on where they can get a hold of you if they want to talk to you. Yeah. I really think um, overcoming fear is really latch on to something that you really believe in that is greater than yourself. There's something out there that's bigger than yourself. Latch on to that. And for me, it's, it's God and Jesus. For other people, maybe the universe, maybe something else. But latch on to that knowing that, that there is something working in the background for the good of you. And that things are happening for you and not to you. Um, you can reach me at um, ibwogistics.com or at Inertia Medical. Or my personal Instagram is killing it, A-I-L-L-I-N. Um, 24 underscore seven. Cool. Yeah. You'll send that. I'll put those in the show notes. If some, if people want to get in touch with you, yeah. but, um, it's been uh, really great talking to you on, on the, on yeah. the, I said, I got to have you on. You were doing so many things, you know, and you've experienced a lot of stuff in your life and I, I and you've done a lot of great things too. Um, I try. You know, so I wanted to get you on just to kind of share your your thoughts, and I appreciate I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you too. I appreciate the opportunity to do this, and I appreciate the gifts that you have—the gift of communication. You're able to facilitate a great conversation and show empathy and react to things I say, and uh, and 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 connect with your your person who you're talking to. I, I I felt that from you in this in this conversation. All right, that's awesome. That's good to hear. I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep bringing the guests on but I, pre- I, I you, you've you been a great guest and I appreciate it but we're going to see each other in a couple of days alright yeah, very exciting alright all right, we'll all talk right. to you soon that was Chris Arsberger fellow Arte brother he, he owns uh, IB Logistics and he's a life coach and also he's helping um, you know these, these kids uh, and, and families you know low income families he's very fortunate and he's been through a lot and you know the family trying to keep them at a, at a you have to do the best that you can right uh, and so but sometimes people you know parents set the bar way too high and then if their kids um you know they get straight a's and they get one b then they, they like melt right which is not fair for the kids i mean they, you got to push your kids and make them do the best that they possibly can but you know you also have to just you know be with them and kind of see what their feelings are and, and just kind of guide them through stuff but He's also was in combat, right? Air Force, like bullets flying <laughs> past him, crazy stuff. I haven't been in, I haven't been in the, uh, the armed forces, but I heard a lot of stories about people, and I respect them. Man, fantastic people. Everybody should respect these guys, you know, and what they've gone through. And he's a man of faith, right? You know, and and he he tries to instill that faith in uh the kids and the people that he uh, coaches and mentors and you know and, and it pulls them through and and god pull, pulled them through and god pulled me through and it pulled a lot of you through as well and um you know if if you're kind of lost and you don't know where to turn you know pick up a bible start reading i read it every day right proverbs awesome i'm on psalms now Man, Proverbs, I just keep reading over and over. So much gold in there. It's fantastic. Uh, but any book, any holy book, if you're Muslim, pick up the holy book. You know, Jewish, pick up the holy book. Well, the Bible is part uh, uh, Jewish, but they have the Torah. and Or whatever religion you're in, you know, go back. Talk to a priest. Talk to somebody, you know, and, and get that faith and understand that there is there is a God out there. There's someone, there's a force out there, right? There's the universe, whatever you like to call it, but there is energy and there's a higher power that we have to tap into and, and pull us up. You know, things seem bad, but and he, he mentioned it, you know, Chris mentioned it, uh, things happen 
they don't happen to you, they happen for you. And, and everything happens for a reason. And, and Chris went through his journey, and now he's helping other people. He's getting them in a better better spot. And then guess what? They're going to get their kids in a better spot, and it's just going to you know, translate, trickle down. So it's fantastic. So that's an awesome call. Chris is a good guy, and I'm looking forward to meeting him. And I appreciate you being on here. Do me a big favor. Go on iTunes or whatever platform. Give us a rating and review. Five stars. That'd be awesome. Subscribe to this podcast. Tell a friend. Tell 10 friends. Whatever you can do to help me out, that gets us up in the rankings. And we got to get more downloads and uh, just get it out there. The more people see this, the more people, um, you know, if I can help one person, like I say, I'm good. I want to help millions. That's my goal. And we'll get there. I got big goals. And I got great people around me. So here we go. Watch out. All right. Help me out. And I appreciate you being here. I hope you got something. Contact me, Michael, at crushingyourfear.com. Anything, you know, you want to have a conversation, whatever. People call me. They schedule appointments. Whatever. I'll have a conversation with you. I'll talk to you. Whatever. If I can help you, I'll point you in the right direction. Whatever. Okay? That's what I got for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And we're going to talk to you next time. Take care. Take care.